Welcome to the third lecture. This segment introduces the notion of basic transformations, which are one of the fundamental concepts in computer graphics. To motivate the problem, consider that in computer graphics, you often have many different coordinate systems. So you may have one coordinate system for the world, you may have one coordinate system for the character in the world, and within that, you may have different coordinate systems for the body, for the arms. To relate them, we must transform between them. So it's very often the case that you have a different geometric model for the arms, you have a different geometric model for the torso, you have a different geometric model for the head. What you want to do is to transform all of them into a common coordinate frame and place this appropriately in the world. It's also particularly important for modeling objects because very often you have a teapot that you've created in your favorite modeling system, but you now want need to place it in the correct location in the world. You need to scale it so it's the appropriate size, and you want to be able to view it from different angles. In fact, that's exactly the assignment that you have in homework one. So here I have my teapot, and what I can do is I can move rotate around it, and so I can rotate the viewer to see it from many different directions. I can also change uh, the viewer in this way and so rotate around the teapot. This is a basic assignment that enables you to create a 3D computer graphics image of some object. And in this way, you'll see what we need to do technically to get these transformations in viewing to actually work. This unit is about the math for these transformations. In the earlier lecture, we introduced the notions of vectors and matrices. All of the transformations are represented using matrices and they act by matrix vector multiplication. Throughout the lecture, we will be showing examples and demos, both with homework one, which you just saw, and with an applet. I just want to say a few words about this applet. This is the transformations game applet it comes courtesy of the Brown University Exploratories of Software, and they've really done an amazing job creating a range of applets that can be used for instructional purposes. I've given you a link below, and the uh, main people responsible for this are Professor Andy Van Dam and Jean Laliouf. I would very seriously encourage you to go through and look through all of the applets. They're very exciting. So this is what the applet looks like. And it's really set up as a game. We won't be using it as such in the lecture. But the idea is that I have this house and I want to move this house in such a way that it aligns with the house on top. So here I pull down some translations and I can get it to align. When it does that, it's very happy and you score a point. Of course, the examples in later sections are much more challenging and so here is an example where you have to actually get it to rotate in this way. You might be interested in playing with it, but we're just going to use it as a basic mechanism to teach the various types of transformations. And so there's, you can do scale, you can do rotation, you can do translation, and I'll show each of these. Let's give an overview of the general idea of how this lecture will proceed. We will in general have the object in model coordinates, we will transform this object into world coordinates. The points on the object will be represented with vectors, and they will be multiplied by matrices, which correspond to the different transformations. Demos will be shown using the applet I just showed you. This segment deals with 2D transformations, rotation, scales, and shears. The later segments in this lecture will consider other interesting aspects, such as composing transforms, 3D rotations, and then in the next lecture, the segments will handle homogeneous coordinates, which are one of the main breakthroughs in computer graphics, and the ways in which we transform the normals as well for shading. First, let's talk about the scaling transformation. And let me go back to my demo. So here I have uh, the house. And I'm going to put in scale. I don't know whether you can see this uh, at your resolution, but this is an S which controls the amount of scale. So what I can do is I can scale it in the X direction. And note now that the house has become long and thin. 
So scaling can work non-uniformly. It can be different in the x direction from the y direction. I can also put in a scale now along the y direction and now I've just made my house bigger. And let me make it somewhat bigger. At this point the house has been scaled by a factor of 3.5 in both the x and the y directions. The matrix for scaling is a diagonal matrix with the amount of scale in each coordinate noted. So here we have Sx and here we have Sy, which is the scale in the x and y directions respectively. So the x coordinates are multiplied by Sx and the y coordinates are multiplied by Sy. The inverse of the scale is simply taking the x and y scales and taking their reciprocals or 1 over the value. So if I scale by a factor of 2, I invert the scale by scaling by a factor of 1 half. So this is the inverse of Sx and inverse of Sy. And uh, if you have three-dimensional scale, which is what we're interested in, it's just Sx, Sy, and Sc, and each of the coordinates is multiplied by the corresponding scale factor. Next, we come to shear. Shear is a process by which you may take a rectangular shape and turn it into a parallelogram. I'll demonstrate this in a moment. So what you have here is that I'm taking this and I'm moving it like this. And uh, here I'm shearing it in this way. And that's what a shear is. So on the top it's moved to the right, on the bottom it's moved to the left. You can think of this as being held by plates on both sides which and then moving the plates uh, to the right and the left respectively. So I can think of this as being some sort of plates like this where I move this guy here and this guy here and in this way I create a shear. How is the amount of the shear calculated? So first there is the question of the extent of the shear. So generally at the central line there is no shear. So there is no shear here. So no shear. Okay, so this corresponds to the zero shear. And the extent of this shear is equal to A. And assuming that this is one unit here and one unit here. Okay, so similarly this shear would be minus A. So what is the shear matrix? The X coordinate depends on the Y coordinate. So if the Y coordinate is plus one, then the X coordinate goes to plus, moves ahead by a value of A. If the Y coordinate is minus one here, the X coordinate changes by a value of minus A. And so the way the shear can be written is that the Y coordinate does not change. So Y prime is going to be equal to Y. And because of that, the second row of the matrix is just 0, 1. However, in the first row of the matrix, you have that the new value of x, which is x prime, is equal to the old value of x, but now you have to add this quantity, which is the value of a, times the y-coordinate. So how much the shear is will depend on the y-coordinate. And that's why this is 1 and a, right? So x prime is equal to x plus a y. And that is the fundamental equation of the shear. The inverse shear is given by applying minus a. So you have the same shearing formula, but now you apply minus a. We've already talked about scales and shears. The next thing we wish to consider is rotations. In this segment, we're just going to consider 2D. We'll go on to 3D in a subsequent uh, segment. I'll just say a few other words of rotations. Like everything else, there are matrix. So this matrix applied to x plus y is the same as rotating x and then rotating y. So if you have a location on the object, which is, say, the center of mass plus some displacement, rotating that is equivalent to rotating the center of mass and then rotating the displacement. So you can add them together. Rotations are a linear operation, and in 2D they're commutative, in 3D they're not. 
And let me show you an example of that. So here we have uh, the our transformations game again. I'll leave the scale in so that just it looks a little bit easier to see. And now I'm going to put in a rotation. And I'm going to rotate by 40 degrees. So I've rotated it and you can see that the object has moved. I can also put in an inverse rotation. And so let's say this is an inverse rotation of minus 90 degrees. It's not the exact inverse of the 40 degree rotation. In fact, it makes it go the other way. But the point I'm making is notice where the uh, house is now. If I swap the order of the rotations, I still get back to the same location. So swapping the order of the rotations has no effect for 2D rotations. It will matter, however, for 3D rotations. The remaining question is what is the matrix for a rotation in 2D? And this is what we'll now proceed to derive. This is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. And we have a point P here that we want to rotate to some point P prime where the angle between these is some angle theta. So this will be an angle theta. So how can we represent this rotation? Well, it's easiest to do it in polar coordinates. So we let P equal to some radius, which is some radius R times cosine of alpha. So this angle here is equal to alpha, okay, and it's going to be equal to r times sine of alpha. So what is p prime now equal to? Well, so now this combined angle for p prime is going to be equal to alpha plus theta. So this is going to be equal to r cosine, and now we say this is alpha plus theta, and it's going to be equal to the sine of alpha plus theta. That's a, the coordinates are going to be equal to that. All right, so this is the coordinates of P prime. It's easier to see this in polar coordinates. In order to get the Cartesian coordinates, we now need to abuse standard trigonometric identities to expand cos of alpha plus theta and sine of alpha plus theta. So cos of alpha plus theta is cos alpha cos theta minus sine alpha sine theta, okay? And sine alpha plus theta sine alpha cos theta plus cos alpha sine theta. So let me just do the x coordinate. So if we look at P prime, uh, what its x value is, that will be equal to r cos alpha cos theta minus r sine alpha sine theta. The interesting thing about this formula is that we can now look at r cos alpha and r sine alpha terms here. And you notice that r cos alpha is just equal to the original value of x. While r sine alpha is just equal to the original value of y. And so this px prime can be written as x times cosine theta minus y times sine theta. And putting all of that together, we see that the value of x prime is equal to x times cos theta minus y times sine theta. Doing a similar derivation for y prime, you see that that's equal to y times cos theta plus x times sine theta. And this is the formula for 2D rotations, the matrix that controls 2D rotations.